Mark chapter 2, we'll start in verse 23 and read to verse 28. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin verse 23. <clears throat> One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat and also gave it to those who were with him. He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Join me as we pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would lift burdens today, that you would lift burdens. Burdened people have walked in. This congregation is filled with them. You see what I can't see. God, please, today, in the name of Jesus, lift the burden. You said you would. So please do that today. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. You may be seated. In the early 1940s, as World War II raged on, the Nazi war machine turned its attention from going west toward England to going east into Russia, but they needed manpower. With all of the available soldiers at the front, the factories were shutting down, the armaments were not producing. They had come up with something called the final solution that was the full extermination of the Jewish population in Europe, in Eastern Europe. The final solution included gas chambers and death camps. It's a horrific thing. You've seen it in history. But as the war raged on, the Nazi regime needed people to work, and so they started taking people out of the death camps and putting them into slave labor. Seven days a week you would work in the factories in Germany. It is said that if you were able to avoid the gas chamber, if you were able to not go to one of those death camps, which was guaranteed death, if you were able to get at a slave labor camp that your expected lifespan was four weeks. Besides the hard labor and deficient food and rank living conditions, one of the major factors contributing to such a terrible death rate was that there was never a day off. Never something to look forward to. Never something to think about in the future. People can't live like that. You, you can't live like that. You and I were not designed to live like that. From the very dawn of creation in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God designed man and woman, human beings, to have one day that is unlike any other day. A day that is set aside. He will even go so far, God that is, he will even go so far as to take and make the Sabbath day one of the Ten Commandments. When you read the Ten Commandments, you find out that the commandment on the Sabbath day is the longest of the Ten Commandments. He did that for a reason. He did that so that humans would flourish. He did that so that his people would flourish as they went into the land. Like so many other good things that God does, over the centuries, the thinkers, the religious leaders would build fence after fence after fence around the commandment. In order, they said, to protect the commandment, but fence after fence after fence 
By the time Jesus shows up on the scene in Mark chapter 2, a commandment that a commandment that was given for the good of people, for the freeing of the people, had become harsh and restrictive and legalistic, perverting God's, perverting God's good intent for that one day. In the passage before us, Jesus is in trouble again. In fact, the sequence is here. There are six times back to back to back. Mark is writing to a Gentile church in Rome. He wrote this for the new church to show them Jesus is full of grace and how he's in trouble and trouble and trouble. First time we hear of Jesus being in trouble is that he claims to have the authority to forgive sins. Remember that with the paralytic? The second time he's in trouble is when he calls Levi, who is Matthew, wrote the book of Matthew, calls Levi to follow him. Levi is so overcome with joy, he throws a party for Jesus. Levi invites all of his friends, who are his friends, tax collectors and sinners. The Pharisees see Jesus eating with the tax collectors. He's in trouble. The third time he's in trouble is when John the Baptist and his disciples and the Pharisees and his disciples, they're all fasting in an effort to show how close they are to God, and Jesus and his disciples are not fasting. But this time, this time is different. This time he's in trouble because of the accusation of breaking a commandment. And in this passage, Jesus scrubs all of the barnacles of legalism away to show us the glorious freedom, the wonderful flourishing he brings to every man and woman that will follow him. You, you were not designed to be ground down into fine powder. You are not designed to be weighed down with burdens and made, have your life made despondent. God didn't make you to dread each day, to be overwhelmed with work and weighed down by care. He's come to lighten your load. He's come to strengthen your soul. He's come to save your life. When you read this passage today, I want you to see it. I want you to see that Jesus, Jesus doesn't enslave people, he frees them. Jesus doesn't enslave people, he frees them. Let's go to the Bible and see if we can get at it. Let's make it like a Bible study. I'll try to hang some points, give you something to sort of hold on to, but we'll keep going back to the Bible. This will all be centered on Jesus, as every sermon should be. Here's the first one, number one. Jesus doesn't put burdens on you. He removes them. Jesus does not put burdens on you. He removes them. Let's join the story right there in Mark. Notice how he gives us some background. Verse 23 and 24, let me read it with some comment. Join me there. You just keep looking at the Bible. I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things. On one Sabbath, Mark just stacks these stories up for us. and We don't know the time frame when this happened. All we know is on one Sabbath, what we know is this is the Sabbath day, the Saturday, the Jewish day of rest, the day of the command, the day when God rested. On a Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. They weren't harvesting. It was a time of harvest. You're not allowed to work. But this feels a little bit, if you're a legalist, this feels like work to the Pharisee. So they see it, verse 24. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Jesus, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, it's one thing not to fast. That was just a tradition. It's another thing altogether to be accused of breaking one of the Ten Commandments. That's exactly what the Pharisees are doing down in verse 24. Why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? They're breaking so when I'm reading this, I started wondering, were they actually breaking one of the commandments? I mean, the commandment is to keep the Sabbath day holy, you're not working, so harvesting would be working. So if they were harvesting those grains, yes, then they were breaking it. But Deuteronomy tells us 
Deuteronomy 23, verse 25 says that you can pick the kernels with your hands, but you couldn't put a sickle to the standing grain. Sort of the welfare system in Judaism was if you were harvesting a field, you'd keep the corners so that those that didn't have anything could walk through and have something to eat. So it was allowed to do that. Maybe, maybe that's not what the Pharisees were talking about. Maybe they were talking about the fact that they were walking. You see, over the years, the religious leaders, in an effort to come up with ways to keep people from working and to keep them from breaking the commandment, if the commandment was to keep the Sabbath day holy and not working, so they started coming up with rules and rules and rules. In fact, the Talmud, the Jewish uh, commentary, the Talmud would have 29 pages of things you can't do on the Sabbath day. Several things you can't do. One of the things you can't do uh, was walking. You can't walk more than 1,999 steps on the Sabbath day. So if you have an Apple Watch or a step counter, you can look back. A lot of you, every day is a Sabbath day for you. You, you can't, I don't know how they counted the steps, but you couldn't walk that many steps. If you were a carpenter, you couldn't carry a saw. If you were a scribe, you couldn't carry a pen. If you were a tailor, you couldn't uh, thread a needle or, or even carry the needle. If you, were, had a, if you had two balls in your hand, a ball, you couldn't throw it up with one hand and catch it with the other. You had to catch it with, so I don't know what you would do. One of the rules, uh, this is no joke, one of the rules was that a woman was not allowed to look in the mirror on the Sabbath day, because she might see a gray hair and be tempted to pluck it out. I didn't make that up. That's what the Talmud said. So you can see how all of these rules they had put over the Sabbath day and crusting it so that all of the joy of rest was gone. And the rules overlaying the Sabbath day had become so oppressive that the Sabbath day was no longer a blessing. It was a burden. Look, it's what legalism does. Be careful with your Christianity when you, when you walk away from grace into legalism. It's what man-made tradition does. It takes what God has given to free us and to relieve us and makes it oppressive. Makes knowing God a burden. Then Jesus walks in. Jesus comes in not with legalism and oppression and slavery, not with pressure. What did he say? What did Matthew tell us that he said? Jesus says, Come to me. Come to me, all of you who labor. You're heavy laden, you're burdened. You come to me, I'll give you rest. You take the yoke that I have upon you. Learn from me. You see, I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls, rest for your souls. As Jesus takes your burden and puts it on his back. We preach this every Sunday when we talk about the gospel. What do we mean about the gospel? When we talk about gospel, we don't just mean living right. We mean the gospel saves those of us that can't live right, that the gospel teaches that all of us have sinned before God and stand under condemnation. God created us to live in fellowship with him. Our lives break that fellowship. We are sinners. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death and we're separated. But the Bible also gives us the gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ comes as a man. He lives in the place of men and women. He does what we should have done, live perfectly in fellowship with God. He does that for us. He then goes to the cross and, and we've got a debt to pay. We have punishment we're supposed to receive. At the cross, all of the punishment, now look, every sin you've ever committed, all of your sins at the cross, they are punished on Jesus. And the gospel promise is, if you'll look to Jesus, you look there. If you look to him as your substitute, he will save you. Now that's the gospel and that's our sins but let's not forget that as gospel believers, we trust that all of our burdens are there too. That he also takes our burdens to the cross. Would you? Would you right now, right now, 
even with your eyes open if you have to, with your, you can bow if you'd like, ask God in the name of Jesus, ask God to lift, lift your burden. Ask God right now, ask him to lift your burden. Whatever sin that it is that has you trapped, ask God to lift. Whatever pain that has you crippled, ask God to lift it. Maybe you see the clouds of depression starting to gather around your heart. Ask God to take those away. Maybe you're just spiritually exhausted, just exhausted. Ask God to renew your soul. Maybe you've got this harbored hatred for someone that really did wrong you, really did, and you just can't let go. Ask God. Watch it evaporate. Maybe you're struggling with some bitterness at someone. Ask God. Let's take that burden and nail it to the cross. You see, Jesus, Jesus doesn't put burdens on you. He removes them. There's something else to look at when you think about Jesus. Let's get into the story itself. Here's the second thing Jesus doesn't do. Number two, Jesus doesn't break the law. A few years ago, a prosperity preacher said, Jesus breaks the law for love. Jesus does not break the law. He fulfills the law. Let me show where I get that. I'm going to read you verses 25 and 26. In verse 25 and 26, Jesus uses an argument. It's a how much more argument. It is a lesser to greater argument. I'm trying to illustrate the argument. In my house, we have a 10-year-old beagle dog named Spurgeon. Spurgeon is completely useless. He's loud, he eats, he doesn't do tricks, uh, he sleeps. There's nothing special about that dog. Beagles live a long time. Uh, We're halfway through, I'm guessing, with the dog. (laughs) Every morning, Connie gets up and she feeds that dog and talks nice to that dog and pets that dog. That's the lesser. So I can look at that activity that's going on with that dog and make a greater argument. If that dog that doesn't do anything in this house gets talked nice to and fed and even petted, how much more will I be treated by Connie? (laughs) I find myself comparing myself to a dog. So what you're going to watch Jesus do here, he's going to take a story from from David's life in 1 Samuel. He's going to tell the story when David's on the run from Saul. And when he goes into the tabernacle and takes the showbread and eats it, not supposed to eat that bread, 12 loaves reserved only for the priests. They would eat those once a week on Sabbath day. They would trade them out. Nobody eats the showbread, showbread but the priest. David eats that and isn't held accountable. It's not reckoned to him as something wrong. And what Jesus is going to say is if David did that, how much more? Should it be okay for what we're doing? So let's go to it, verse 24, uh, 25 and 26. And he said to them, have you never read? Now let me pause here. That was an insult. That was, don't you know the Bible? You ever had somebody say, well, my Bible says, as if somehow your Bible is deficient. Jesus is saying, haven't you read the Bible? Have you never read what David did? When he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, now he entered, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar, the high priest, and he ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also he gave it to all of those who were with him. And here's the point that Jesus is making. If David could do that, and actually break a law, how much more can Jesus just break a tradition? A couple things, a couple things to think of here, a couple of things to, to roll around in our hearts. The first one is kind of a practical, maybe a practical application. While it was not normal and it was not lawful for David and his men to eat the bread of the presence, those 12 loaves, on a gold table in front of the ark. They should not have eaten those. It was not lawful and not normal for them to eat them. It was also the case that God didn't want David and his men to starve. So you have this meeting of a human need over a ritual requirement. This is the the Good Samaritan with the priest walking by. 
But there's more to it, though. I think that's one thing. I think there's a theological. I think Jesus is doing something right here. When Jesus speaks, Mark 2, at the end of the chapter, when he uses David, Jesus is, he is inviting a comparison between David and himself. And he's saying, David is a lesser king. Jesus is a greater David. David is the lesser king. Jesus is the greater David. And Jesus will fulfill all the law and all the prophecies of this king coming in the line of David. And if David ate the bread of the presence, then Jesus is the bread of life. And his appearance right here is when it starts to shift now. His appearance signals a shift, signals a new day a lifting of the burdens, a fulfilling of the law. Now look, Jesus is not in any way downplaying the law. He is not in any way breaking commandments. He's downplaying all the legalism, all of the oppressive tradition that has so clouded the eyes of the people that they couldn't see God, they couldn't feel hope, they couldn't know life. And now Jesus comes to make things right. To lift your burden. To feed your soul. There's so many, so many. There are so many people sitting in the congregation right now that feel empty and hollow and listless and detached. And here comes Jesus, who fulfills all the requirements, all the requirements that God has for his people, all of the hard discipline, all of the keeping of the law. He does all of that, and he comes in and removes the heavy yoke. The yoke of legalism is, a, is choking. He removes the heavy yoke of legalism, and he attaches to you a yoke of grace. You can't even feel it. You see, the promise is, the cross of Jesus promises grace. Do you feel trapped? Do you feel defeated? Do you feel lost? Listen, Jesus doesn't, Jesus doesn't enslave people. He frees them. He doesn't put burdens on you. He, he removes them. Jesus did it. He didn't do it by breaking the law. He fulfills it. Let's pick up the pace a little bit. It gets astounding here in verse 27 and verse 28. I'll give you the third thing Jesus doesn't do. Number three, Jesus doesn't bind us. Jesus doesn't bind us. He frees us. Let me show you what I mean. Verse 27, it's a, it's a remarkable and revolutionary thing for Jesus to say in verse 27. And he said to them, the Sabbath, look even how it's said, it's poetic. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. On either end of the sentence is the word Sabbath. Rest is made for man in the middle. Says to the Pharisees, you got it all wrong. God made this day to serve man's needs. He didn't make man to serve this day's needs. Why, why did God give us the Sabbath? Why? Why did he make it so that in the pattern there are six days to work, one to rest? Well, very basically, he just gave us that one, we need a day of rest. You need to rest. You need a day of rest. You are not superman or superwoman. You need rest. God gave us a day. You, he did that by design. You are designed to have a day to rest. You are designed to have a day where you worship. Where well, that day is different, you worship. A day where you remember the good grace of God, that you have a God that loves you. You remember that. That day is given to God's people to distinguish us from other people. When there are otherworldly pursuits, God's people have a different day to be distinguished, to, 
to protest against a culture that has turned its back on God. This is a form of protest. This day shows dependence. One day you say, I'm not working today. I know I've got to provide. We're trusting that God provides. One day, this one day is imitating God from creation. He didn't need to rest. After six days of creation, he did. And we as his people, we imitate him to, to celebrate creation. Why is the Sabbath given to mankind? It's for the good of your body. It's the good of your soul. So that we don't get weary. The Sabbath then was given to point us to the greater rest that is in Christ. What, are the, what do Christians do with the Sabbath? Why don't we go to church on a Saturday? The writer of Hebrews speaks to this, and he writes about it in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. He says, that, so, then, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did. Andy Davis, the great pastor at First Baptist Durham, North Carolina, the brilliant man, Andy Davis tells us that the days are different, and here's why. The Old Covenant in the Old Testament looks back at creation and the law and the Sabbath. The New Covenant looks forward to the new creation and the Lord's day. The Old Covenant has its week ending with the Sabbath. The new covenant has its week starting with the Lord's day. I think Paul, when he wrote to the church at Colossae, is very helpful. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, is very helpful when I think through why do we worship like we do on a Sunday. This is what he says. <clears throat> Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon, slow down, or a Sabbath. These, the Sabbath, these are a shadow of the things to come. They point to the things that are coming, but the substance belongs to Christ. You see, our, our rest is in Christ. Our joy is in Christ. Our, our strength is in Christ. Our righteousness before God is in Christ. Our purpose in life, our direction, the forgiveness we receive is in Jesus. Rest your soul's rest. You see, Jesus doesn't bind us. He frees us. What is it then? What is it? What is it that's got you all bound up? Is it un, unconfessed sin? Is it an unsure future? Is it, is it some sort of unresolved pain? Is it an unreconciled friendship? What is it? What has you like that? Jesus comes not to bind you. The gospel comes to free us. That's verse 27. Let me give you one last, one last bombshell from Jesus down in verse 28. I'll just give this point the title, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Join me there in verse 28. You read it, you read it for yourself. It's astounding. Jesus says, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. That's a bombshell. This is a declaration of deity. Here is Jesus on the very front end of his ministry. Here is Jesus making a divine claim. Here is Jesus claiming the divine right over the law. Here is Jesus saying, I was there at creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was there. There at the giving of the law. I have the right, Jesus is saying. I am the ruler of this day. I am the sovereign Lord of the Sabbath, sovereign ruler of this day. 
I am the interpreter of God's will for this day. You don't set the standard of behavior on the Sabbath day. I do. This is the truth claim. Here is, here is the truth claim that Jesus is God. And he's worthy of your worship. He took the burden of sin, every sin, every sin, name him. He took the burden of sin, every sin. And he carried those sins to the cross. He died there for the burden on a Friday. Count the days out with me now. Count the days out. On a Friday. On a Saturday, he lay still. Saturday is the Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath. Jesus kept the last and final Sabbath, lay still. A new covenant comes. A new covenant on the Lord's day. God raised him from the dead on a Lord's day. On a Sunday, God raised him from the dead. Victory and hope and grace and smashing legalism. God raised him from the dead on a Sunday. Now he calls for all of you to, to come, to enter that rest by faith. Unyoke yourself from all that other. Take on the yoke of grace that is Christ. Come to Jesus. He doesn't enslave. He frees us. This morning, with your heads bowed, join me in a moment of prayer. This morning, with your heads bowed, we go to the, our last song, our invitation song. If you've carried a burden in, don't walk out with it. There's no need. It's not true. It's not right. Jesus takes it. Maybe this morning, when we sing, you want to you just symbolically come and just be here in the house of God with God's people and just come and pray. I'll invite you to come and pray. Be ashamed of that. Come and pray for yourself, for somebody you know and love, some burden you can't shake. Maybe you don't need to pray before you talk to a pastor about what it means to give your life to Jesus, to have that burden lifted, to have it taken away. You don't, don't walk out of here with it. If God has spoken to your heart and He was speaking to you today from His Word, come to Jesus. He doesn't put a burden on you. He lifts the burdens from you. Father, thank you in the name of Jesus for the good grace you give us in Christ. Thank you for the joy of worship. Thank you for forgiveness of sins. Thank you for taking our burdens. I pray you lift them now. Lift them in the name of Jesus. Lift the burdens from people. May they have the, the joy of walking in the grace you give us. Strengthen, strengthen us. And Lord, thank you for this day, a new day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please, as we sing together?